It's time for the Daily Stand-Up Podcast presented by Agile Dad with your host, Lee Henson. Without any further ado, let's get started. I always love it when I get email from people who listen to the podcast, especially when they're asking me about certain topics or specific topics. So I got an email from one of my students named Luke, and one of the conversations we had in advanced product owner class was talking about the difference between a key stakeholder, a stakeholder, and an interested party. And this is something that a lot of people get confused with, and um, I hope I'm not putting you on the spot. But basically, he inquired, he says, how do you go about setting these boundaries? Oftentimes, it feels like anyone who is involved with a project, developers to end users, you know, all the way across the spectrum, think they have the final say. And it forces us to create unreasonable, unrealistic work in progress, right? So you have too many things in flight, and you're not able to get anything done with decent quality. This is a common problem. This is something that I see a lot. And part of it has to do with organizations not really understanding the cost of context switching. If they don't understand just how much it costs for people to be bouncing all over the place and the loss of productivity, what winds up happening is you end up having 100 things in flight when you really should only have 10 or 50 things in flight when you should really only have five. And it causes people to really bounce around. So I'm going to do the best I can in a short amount of time to explain each of these three to you in hopes that it will help you get your thoughts organized around who these people are. Because the truth is, there's no concrete definition that says, hey, it's always this person with this title. So let's give you a, let's give you a little rundown and see what we can do. So let's start with a key stakeholder. So the key stakeholder is usually someone, if you think about a project and you're like, if this person didn't exist, we wouldn't have this project. This is the person who oftentimes pays. They're oftentimes sponsor. But most importantly, this is the person that you just cannot live without. This is the person who's on all the critical decision-making pieces. This is the person who is the face of the product or service. This is the person who represents. This is the person you would go to if you needed someone to drop the hammer or drop the gauntlet and do a tie-breaking decision. This is that person that they can't easily be replaced. You can't live without them on a project. And there's usually only a single entity, a single person who fulfills this role. So what I'm saying is the key stakeholder is usually pretty easy to identify. Now, with a key stakeholder, they often are a guiding force for the product owners uh, and other stakeholders to help them understand the direction in which we're taking a product. So a key stakeholder often, uh, oftentimes also drives the direction. So sometimes there's a little bit of crossover between your key stakeholder and your functional analyst or your key stakeholder and a chief product owner. Those roles kind of overlap at times, but it doesn't mean there's a hard, fast rule that your chief product owner or your functional analyst, there's no hard, fast rule that says that those are your key stakeholder, but they could be. So it's a matter of looking and seeking out and asking yourself the question, who is it on this project that makes all the cogs in the, in the, in the wheel turn, that makes everything you know, flow like it should, like a well-oiled machine? And who is it that you could not easily live without? Who's that person that's just the glue that's holding the project together? And if you can identify who that person is, that's probably going to put you in a very good place. So for me, uh, the key stakeholder, once again, someone you can't live without, someone who is the go-to for all things, and someone who can't easily be replaced on a project, it would be if you said the name of a project, they'd be like, oh, that's Mary's project, or oh, that's Jim's project, right? It's just, it's that person that is the face of what's going on, and oftentimes they feel the more functional, practical, strategic drive behind the product that you're building or service. Okay, so let's go to the opposite route, and let's talk about an interested party. An interested party is someone who could be an end recipient of the product. An interested party is someone who could be uh, affected by some type of integration with a product that they service. It's just they have some level of interest, but but they don't have any skin in the game. They're not a stakeholder. They're generally, if they're making requests, it's usually requests for enhancements. They're not. They're not necessarily a stakeholder because they they aren't getting into the backlog with items as frequently or regularly. It's just they want to check in from time to time, sometimes often, to make sure that whatever you're building doesn't have direct impact on what they do. 
So if you're thinking about someone on a development team or someone on, you know, an end user or whatever the case may be, anyone who is not directly affected in a way that it would inhibit their ability to do something, I guess the easiest way for me to explain it, that would be an interested party. So an interested party is just someone who says, yeah, yeah, I, I, that, that's pretty cool. Let's see what's going on, right? And it, it sounds kind of hokey, but it's exactly what the name says. They just have a level of interest, but they don't have any stake in what's going on, which means the stakeholder sits right in the middle of those two. The stakeholders, though, this is interesting, come and go. So from time to time, you may have someone who's a stakeholder who represents a different product that needs one feature inside of your product so that they can get certain information or whatever the case may be or vice versa. Stakeholders are people who come in and say, hey, you know, I need your product to touch this or I need this service to behave this way or I need to know what you're doing here because it's going to directly impact something that I'm doing. Now, once you satisfy whatever that one request is or whatever those two little needs are, this person can come and go. This person will go away. You might not see this person again. They might come back a few weeks later and say, hey, now I need this. This is a person who has skin in the game. They have stake because whatever you're doing is going to directly impact whatever they're doing. But they're not necessarily a key stakeholder because they come and go. Uh, and they change. Uh, one, one, sometimes the product or project that they're working on advances and no longer needs to integrate with what you have. Sometimes the product or project that they're working on um, only has one touch point with your product. And once you satisfy that, they move on. So it's just one of these things where they do exist and you need to understand who they are because you want to make sure that their needs are satisfied, but they're not that key stakeholder that's going to consistently live with you from cradle to grave uh, on a product or service that you're trying to build. So when you understand who's who, it's okay, and I want to make sure I emphasize this, for you to feel requests from any of those three. Interested parties can even give you requests. I think that's important to notate, right? So I'm not saying that you know one's bad or one's good or that you have to pay more attention or less attention to one or the other. What I am saying is that the key stakeholder is going to be with you forever and ever. So it's one of those things where if I were in a position of leverage, I would say, okay, let's listen closely to the things that the stakeholders are telling us, but let's listen even more closely to the, to the needs and a strategic awareness of the key stakeholder because that's going to, who's going to help drive us in the right direction. But oftentimes, when we're talking about innovation, uh, those, those innovative things, sometimes they come from just interested parties. So it's important to listen to all three voices and to gather information. But it's also important to come in with a little bit of bias saying, you know, I know this key stakeholder is not going anywhere, so I'm going to have to do everything within my power to make sure I satisfy whatever requests they have so that we can keep the train on the tracks and keep people happy and keep people moving in the right direction. But I think the biggest piece of this that I don't want to go unnoticed is where you talked about limiting WIP. When you're talking about limiting WIP, there's three places where WIP is limited. The first place is an organizational WIP. And this is oftentimes where it's controlled on a roadmap, for example. And I tell people that those key stakeholders need to get together and decide, you know, we can't have 50 projects or products in flight at any given time. What is a suitable number? What makes sense? And make sure you're limiting WIP at an organizational level. The second WIP limit is applied at the team level, that the team's only going to take on so much work during a sprint, that they're only going to have so much work in flight at any given time. This is going to help the team not carry items over from one sprint to the next so that they can pair together, do peer reviews, have higher quality, increase their team size because they don't have as many items in flight, and actually get work done. They're going to do Little's Law. They're going to stop starting new work and start finishing the work that they've started, right? And they're going to do this by limiting WIP. And then individuals can also limit WIP. When I'm talking about limiting individual WIP, this is, this is avoiding that case where you know, you sign up for eight things at sprint planning, you start working on the first one, you get 75% of the way done and said, I'm bored. I'm going to work on the next one, squirrel. I'm going to work on the next one, squirrel. And by the end of the sprint, you end up having eight things that are 85% of the way done. So you try to crash them all down at the end. And it, it just gives the appearance that the team really didn't do a whole lot of work during a sprint. When in actuality, you got 10 things, 85% of the way done because you're bouncing all over the place. So I hope this is helpful for you, and it should act as a guide to help you better understand and to better focus on why limiting WIP is so important. But also, it tells you the, the tale of the key stakeholder. And, and this piece of advice was one that I was given uh, at the end of class uh, many, many, many months ago. 
And I thought it was a great piece of advice. And I'm going to share it with you here. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So when it comes to handling stakeholders or interested parties or even key stakeholders, let them know that their concerns are warranted, that you care about what they're trying to do, but also in no uncertain terms, within that empathy, let them know with truthful honesty, let them know with radical candor that in order to do this, it's going to make other things become sacrificial. It's going to, you're going to have to give up things to get them to where they need to be and make sure you're transparent about, hey, that sounds like a really great idea, but if we integrate that, that means we're going to lose this and this, and I don't know how these two people are going to feel about that, right? So it's one of those things where transparency is key. Make sure you understand and can leverage data to show where you are and what's going on, and then make sure you have you, you behave with empathy and act with empathy, but also stand firm on the things that you can and cannot do. So uh, that's going to do it. I hope that you learned a lot from this episode. This was a big one. If you have a topic you want to cover, make sure you reach out to us. Learn more at AgileDad.com. We'd love to hear from you so we can cover your topic. As always, we encourage you to stay healthy, stay well, and stay agile, my friends. Until next time, do take care. Yeah.